Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to turn on my camera here real quick so you can see it's a real person behind the computer. Um, thank you very much for joining. Uh, probably more people will be joining us tonight. Um, it's a great weather, the one that we're having today, so I don't blame producers if they're out there working. We've had a lot of rain, so it's nice that they're able to go out and do the work. Um, welcome to tonight's uh, webinar about our Conservation Stewardship Program, aka CSP. My name is Tari Colon and I'll be moderating with you tonight. I want to thank you for the time to join. Right now, we'll turn it over to Eric Ann Boyland, our acting state conservationist, for some opening remarks. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? All right, we perfect. Can. Thank yes. you, Ty. So good evening again, everyone. My name is Erica Boylan. I am the acting state conservationist for New Jersey. Um, I want to say thank you all for showing up here today uh, to uh, be with the team here, um, especially, and thank you to the team for uh, setting this up for after hours. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is to help to amplify the conservation stewardship program. When I started my career uh, years ago, it was the Conservation Security Program. And so it has since evolved. And what we're trying to do is, you know, again, to help to amplify, you know, this program because everyone is very used to our Fix It program, Equip, right? And so we are looking for those folks who are already great stewards of the land and trying to um, have you all to, you know, take a look at the CSP program uh, to see if there are any activities that you would like to um, have a part of your operation or your, your management operation. And, and so, again, you're going to hear a lot of information. What we're trying to do is, one, educate the public um, even more about the CSP program, um, bringing it into a more intimate setting versus you hearing about, you know, an, an announcement about the program. But we wanted to bring you all in-house here today, you know, across teams uh, to for you all to be able to ask us any specific questions that you may have regarding the program to give you more insight uh, regarding the program versus, you know, you just having to fill out an application, you know, in, in the office or online or wherever you are. But what we're trying to do is really communicate to you all the importance of being not, well, you already know the importance of being good stewards, but the importance of the CSP program and how, how it works and how it could be of benefit to you and your operation. And so again, I want to say thank you to all of you for your participation here this evening. Um, as Ty had mentioned, you know, it is warm outside, so uh, you will could be out there doing, you know, some other things out there across the landscape. But we are definitely appreciative for your support because we are here uh, to serve you all and to be here present with you all to help you uh, with with any questions and that you may have regarding the CSP program. So again, thank you and thank you, Ty, for for uh, giving me this opportunity to do opening remarks. Absolutely, thank you, Erica. So um, before we start, I would like to go over some items so you to help your participation in today's event. If you have any questions, please pose them in the chat or feel free to use the raise hand button. Um, Jacob will be monitoring the chat for those questions. If you're joining us from your phone, feel free to email me your questions. My email address is on the registration page, or you can text them to 732-616-0314. Additionally, today's webinar is being recorded. So let's go over today's agenda. Um, we're going to cover a little bit of what CSP is. We're going to go over some enhancement examples uh, as well as some payment examples. Since payment with CSPs can be a little bit more complicated than our regular equip program. We're going to talk about what are the next steps. Uh, we probably will Hopefully, we'll have some producers joining us later to share their story with CSP. Then we're going to address your questions and hopefully call it a day. 
So now I will turn it over to Fran. Um, she will start with the CSP overview. Friend, I'm, I'm coming. Can you see my screen? <laughs> can you see my screen, Kai? Yes, I can. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to turn my camera on for just a brief minute to introduce myself. I am Fran Deficio. I'm a program specialist here in New Jersey for NRCS. So I am going to give you today um, a quick overview of um, the CSP uh, program. So let me just turn my camera off. And Ty, you could still see my screen? That's correct. Okay, good. All right, perfect, perfect. So thank you, Ty. Um, and thank you for joining NRCS this evening for a conservation stewardship program um, overview. Oh, uh, hold on. There we go. So CSP um, has been available to owners and operators since the early 2000s. What once was what I thought was a more difficult program to understand has been revamped through the years to make it easier for NRCS to provide technical and financial assistance to farmers, rewarding them for both their active management of ongoing conservation efforts and adoption of new additional conservation enhancements on their entire farming operation. So who is eligible? From the smallest to the largest farms that have cropland, pasture land, and forest land that are the owner operator or operator that has controlled the land for five years may be eligible for CSP. Even public land is eligible for CSP as long as it's part of the participants overall operation. Like most of our programs, CSP is competitive. When we meet with you at your farm, the applications are ranked based on your current conservation performance and how much additional work you're willing to address for the priority natural resource concerns identified by NRCS. Contracts last five years, and at the end of that five-year contract, you will be given the opportunity to renew for an additional five years. In the current farm bill, there is a payment limitation of $200,000 for the life of the farm bill for, the, for CSP. But new this year, there is a minimum payment of $4,000 per year. These payments are for unchanging annual payments for active management of ongoing conservation on the operation, plus additional payments for newly adopted conservation practices and enhancements that may vary from year to year. With all of our programs, there's eligibility requirements that must be met. You must have established farm records with the Farm Service Agency. You must be listed as the operator or other operator. You must certify that you are in compliance with highly erodible and wetland conservation requirements. You must have an annual adjusted gross income of $900,000 or less. You must have a determined farm operating plan with the Farm Service Agency. And you must meet the minimum threshold stewardship requirements. With the exception of the minimum threshold uh, stewardship requirements, the other requirements are typical for just about any of our other programs. So some of you may already be eligible for CSP, depending on if you've recently applied for another program. So there are five different land uh, use types that may be eligible for CSP cropland, pastureland, forest land, associated ag land, and farmstead. Associated ag land and the farmstead cannot be standalone. These are only evaluated with one of the other three land uses. NRCS uses program software, along with a site visit to evaluate the current resource conditions on your farm, such as soil erosion, soil health, water quality and quantity, and plant condition, just to name a few. 
It's those current resource conditions along with specific categories related to those resource conditions that NRCS establishes the thresholds of your land. There are up to 17 resource concerned categories that are considered. For example, there are specific, there are specific nine that must be considered for cropland. But if any two are already being addressed at time of application and another one addressed by the end of the contract period, you may be eligible for CSP. This is how the stewardship threshold is determined. The state priority resource concerns are taken into consideration during the ranking process, giving applicants the ranking points they deserve for already addressing the resource concerns that we have made a priority. And not everyone that applies may be ready for CSP, and that's okay because we have other programs such as the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQUIP, that may be more suited for an applicant prior to applying for CSP. There are three different types of activities within CSP. Conservation practices, which are common in the program, such as EQUIP, enhancements that take conservation practices to a higher level of stewardship, and bundles, that are land use specific and consist of at least three enhancements that work together to provide increased conservation benefits. If selected for funding, at least one practice, enhancement, or bundle must be planned and implemented in the first 12 months of the contract on any land use that will be receiving a payment. As stated on the previous slide, at least one conservation activity must be scheduled and implemented on a land use indicated included in the contract for payment. You do not need to implement a conservation activity on the land each year, but you do need to implement a conservation activity on the land use during the term of the contract. Annual payments are comprised of contract items for existing conservation activities and additional conservation activities completed in the previous year. Additional activity payments may vary year to year, whereas the existing activity payments will always be the same each year. Every contract will earn a minimum of $4,000 per year and NRCS will make payments as soon as practical after October 1st of each fiscal year for conservation activities completed in the previous fiscal year. I'll cover this in a bit more detail when we get to the payment example portion. Additional activities are paid by the acre, number, feet, etc., and are based on the extent and payment schedule that is established for the program. These activities can be reoccurring, such as cover crops, or a one-time payment for practices such as pollinator planning. Payments for existing activities do not change year to year. You must meet the basic eligibility requirements at the time of application and plan a practice or enhancement. Then you'll receive a fixed payment rate for a resource concerned categories met at the time of application plus a per acre payment by land use and a flat rate for each land use. Again, I'll cover this in a bit more detail during our um, payment example. If you are ready to apply, remember there is eligibility that must be met. NRCS will assess your current conservation performance and plan future conservation activities. If you meet acceptable conservation levels, you will compete in the ranking progress process. And if your application ranks high enough, you will be offered a contract. Although this may have sounded a bit complicated, NRCS really does make applying for programs as painless as possible. We encourage anyone interested in CSP to apply and at least have a talk with us to see if you are a good fit for the program. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I can try to answer those now or um, you can hold your questions and I can answer those um, 
when all of our presentations are uh, completed. So, Ty, that um, concludes my overview of CSP. Thank you, Fran. And I do not see any questions in the chat. Um, so once again, I want to repeat for everyone that joined tonight. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. I think you should have available the raise your hand button. Um, so you can use that as well. And I'm able to unmute you for questions. If not, then feel free to wait until the end or reach out to us. Um, now I will turn it over to Caitlin Farbotnik. She's our NRCS agronomist and grazing specialist that's going to go over some enhancements. OK. All right, hopefully I can get this to share correctly. So Ty, could you let me know if that's showing up OK? Yes, I can see your screen. Awesome. OK. All right, hey everybody. Uh, my name, like Ty said, is Caitlin, and I'm the conservation agronomist and grazing specialist here in New Jersey. And I'm going to go over a couple examples for you, just some some enhancement examples, so you learn what these enhancements are all about. And Don's going to go over some more forestry specific ones right after me. And uh, yeah, so let me get started here. And if you have any questions, um, yeah, drop them in the chat. Raise your hand. Feel free to interrupt me. OK, so uh, let's get started. All right, so there's a lot of different enhancements. I'll start off with that. Uh, there is a national page where there's over 170 enhancements that are listed, which can be a little bit overwhelming. And um, I believe, are, Ty, are all these presentations being sent out, or are they going to be compiled and sent out? We can do that, yes. OK, all right, mm -hmm. so I have some links in in my presentation here and, and when you get that, you'll have links to to some of these sites that I'm going to go over. Um, but you can just Google NRCS CSP enhancements. It'll take you right to a page that looks like like the the head in here and um, you can scroll through all the different enhancements. But I just wanted to to make a note here that there are a lot of different enhancements. So there's a lot of opportunities in CSP to find something that would meet um, or match well with your specific operation. But with that said, um, don't be overwhelmed because if you have worked with us before, if you're brand new working with us, you know that hopefully you know that you will be assigned a planner in your office and your best resource is going to be the conservation planner that's going to be working with you. And the, the planners, our planners are really awesome. Um, they know the ins and outs of all of our programs. They're gonna be able to determine if you're already meeting a standard, which you have to be able to meet a standard in order to do the enhancement for that standard through CSP, um, or you can do the practice. And um, they'll be able to answer any questions that you have throughout the entire process and help narrow down which enhancements may or may not be applicable for you. So um, don't be overwhelmed if you go on that website because your planner, be, you know, in communication with them, they're really great. It's their job to help you. We are here to help you. Uh, so I don't want you to be overwhelmed at all by looking at that. But there are some things that you can do to help your planner figure out which enhancements might be good for your operation. Uh, so before you meet with your planner, um, have an on-site visit there, like I said, there are some things that you can think about. Um, so think about what you're already doing with your operations. Enhancements are just small tweaks that you can make to a practice or a, a technology, a strategy, a method that you're already doing. So think about what you're already doing on your operation and ways that you might be able to make it a little bit better. Uh, something else that you can think about are what are the interests for your operation? Do you have a special interest in raising your organic matter levels? Uh, do you have an interest in integrating wildlife habitat in your operation or designated odd areas that's not really in use to pollinate our habitat? Um, I have a I have a farm, uh, my family farm, and we have a CSP contract on our farm. And one of my special interests is I love dung beetles. Anybody that knows me knows I love talking about dung beetles. They're amazing. I can talk forever about them. And there's an enhancement that is for um, 
improve in dung beetle habitat in your pastures. So of course, like that's one enhancement that we have in our CSP contract. So uh, anything like that, think about things that, that you're interested in for your operation. Also think about ways that you think you can make your operation more efficient. If there's little things that you think you could do. Uh, are you irrigating right now? Are you looking to automate that irrigation system? Um, are there positive changes if, you, if you're a grazing operation? Are there changes that you want to make to the composition of your forages or the amount of your forages, like the quantity of your forages, the quality of those forages, uh, above and beyond what you're already doing? So those are some things that you can think about. Uh, communicate that with your planner. They can help start narrowing down those enhancements before you guys even have an in-person meeting to get you started off on, on a good foot there. So I'm going to go over an enhancement for you so you kind of get to know what these sheets look like and the sorts of things that are in some of these enhancements. So one example that we have here is a pretty simple annual crop example. Um, you know, what's the farmer, our farmer already doing here? Uh, let's assume it's a rotation includes corn, soybeans, wheat, pumpkins, pretty standard rotation. And uh, they are using cover crops. It's a rye annual ryegrass mix, pretty solid cover crop mix. Uh, they are using reduced tillage. They're disking a couple times and using a tiny harrow. They're cover or co broadcasting that cover crop on. They are grazing as part of this operation. Um, there are no perennial crops in this operation. So um, a special interest for the farm, they want to improve their soil organic matter. And that's what this farm is most interested in, and, and that's what they told their planner. So um, the planner that they're working with found a couple enhancements that might be interested to them, and I'm going to show you what these look like. So one of them is uh, this E340C, use of multi-species cover crop to improve soil health and increase soil organic matter. So we know our farmers are already using cover crops, and they have an interest in soil organic matter. And there's a couple cover crop enhancements that are specific to increase in soil organic matter, and we're going to just take a look at this one here. So all those 170 plus enhancements that I talked about have a criteria sheet that look just like this, that explain exactly the, the expectations of what those little tweaks are to your operation and, uh, and the documentation that you would have to give to your planner once you complete that enhancement um, for certification and payment, right? Because we want to fix something and then get paid for it. That's the ultimate goal. All right, so um, the enhancement the requirements for this specific enhancement, uh, they want to have diversity across the entire rotation. So four different crop types across the entire rotation, which can include the cover crop. So our corn, soybean, pumpkin, wheat rotation, we've already have some warm season grasses. We've got some cool season grasses and some warm season broadleafs in there. And our cover crops are more cool season grasses. Um, so we're kind of missing a cool season broadleaf. That's that's kind of a gap we have in diversity in this specific rotation. Something else that we need to look at is a requirement would be having that specific cover crop mix would have to have four different species of two of the above crop types. Right now we have a rye annual ryegrass mix, so we have two grass types in there. So we can diversify this a little bit. Other things that we would want to consider, obviously, no brainer, those covers, whatever we plan, have to be compatible with the other crops in the rotation. Um, they have to be compatible with the plant and the harvest dates of the cash crop, our pesticide usage, and cover crop planting and termination needs to be considered. The cover crop cannot be harvested. This is a little bit different than equip, and you'll find that a lot of these enhancements have just a little bit higher level of management or a little bit higher benefit than some of our equip requirements. So in equip, we can take that cover crop for straw, or we can even take it for a forage. You cannot harvest it as a grain, but for this enhancement, you would have to leave that cover crop in place because the idea is to maximize the amount of residues on the surface. Um, and we would have to have coverage during all non-production periods. And the overall rotation would have to have a positive soil condition index with a positive trend in the organic matter subfactor. 
So this is some jargon that's more NRCSE. Um, the soil condition and index is something that we get from a modeling program called Russell 2. And the planner can figure out those numbers for you and work with you to figure out if your numbers aren't already there, how can we get those numbers there? And you might need to look at other enhancements to get those numbers where they need to be and do a couple enhancements to meet the requirements of this enhancement, um, which could meet the requirements of a couple other enhancements as well. So, um, so there are some things in these criteria sheets that, that are maybe a little bit more NRCSE. All right, that's a cropland example that I have there. Just that's a, a cover crop example. Um, so I am going to move to a grazing example. So this one here, if our folks are interested in keeping track of the body condition scoring of their livestock, um, then this is a this is a pretty cool enhancement. I like this one here. It's using scoring throughout the grazing season to monitor the condition of that livestock and then make adjustments to the conditions or I guess adjustments to the management, which would then influence the condition of the livestock. So um, if our producer is grazing, they would already have a prescribed grazing plan, hopefully. And that prescribed grazing plan would be an NRCS level prescribed grazing plan, which includes a nutrient balance uh, or a forage balance, I'm sorry, information on rotating those animals around, mitigation for sensitive areas, uh, contingency planning and monitoring plans. And then we could write, the, the producer would just write a, a plan on how they're going to do body condition scoring. How often are they going to do it? It has to be at least once monthly, but when are they going to do it? How are they going to do it? Um, what percentage of the herd or flock are they going to use? Um, pictures have to be taken. And um, and then other, if they don't take a picture of every individual, at least they, they have to have documented written scores. And that can just be an amendment to their existing grazing plan. Other things that would be required, obviously the whole idea is to make adjustments. So based on those condition scores, adjustments to any feed or mineral supplements would be made based on the scoring. So here's an example, if you're not familiar with body condition scoring, um, this sheep here is a little bit thin. So if somebody did their body condition scoring, and had a couple individuals in the herd that are a little bit thin, they would find a way to make adjustments to get those body condition scores up a little bit. Now, there's always a little bit of exceptions uh, within the herd individuals. Like, for example, I have one beef cow that always just leans more like a dairy cow. Even when she's overweight, she just looks like an overweight dairy cow. She's got some weird genetics. So um, we just know that like she's always on the thinner side. Um, sometimes you have sick animals. So if this is a, a one that you're interested in, you would just note that, you know, you have a sick animal. Um, but the idea is that this helps you figure out how are your forages and your grazing management and your animals all interacting and making sure that everything is interacting the way it's supposed to and everything is benefiting. So, um, and then the documentation requirements for this one would be the pasture map, your forage balance sheets, your grazing records, which would be how many animals, the weights, when they were moved, um, turn in, turn out heights, you know, your traditional grazing records. Like I said, your photos of the individuals in the herds with the body condition scores labeled on them. Any individuals that don't have photos would still just be listed with the body condition score next to it. And of course, any supplemental feeding that happened, are you feeding just on pasture or are they getting a supplemental grain or hay? And then most importantly, what management changes were made based on those scores? So were those animals moved to a different pasture with better forages if those scores started dropping? Uh, were the animals with lower scores maybe moved in front of the animals that were maintaining their scores? Um, or do they, did you give them priority access? Uh, so things like that. All right, so those are just two quick examples of two enhancements out of all those enhancements, um, but the sorts of things that, that you'll see in, in the CSP contracts. All right, thank you.
Thank you, Kathleen. I do not see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and move on and send it over to Don Donnelly. He's our NRCS forester for some uh, forest land examples. OK, hello, everyone. Give me a second to share my screen here. Have you got it, Ty? Yep, I can see it. OK, I am going to talk about um, using CSP on forested sites, which I think is I personally think is more exciting than Caitlin's talk, but you know, maybe not everybody agrees. Um, and I'm going to do this kind of visually, hopefully, rather than going through it, because I think a lot with the forestry practices, the documentation is often apparent visually. That is one of the ways that will um, kind of capture that information. I'm going to give you a series of examples using a what uh, I'll call as a model uh, forest that's typical of a lot of uh, forests in New Jersey. Um, in this case, this picture represents a, kind of a middle mature uh, hardwood stand. You'll notice that um, the, there are stumps in the in the um, <clears throat> center of the uh, photo which this has been a landowner who's been doing some culling or thinning work to uh, harvest firewood over time. They've been using all that material for um, their own uses and selling some of it. They've also been doing brush management and removing a lot of the um, non-native invasive plants that are in the understory, but you'll notice that in the background there is a, uh, in a fully intact uh, understory that's pretty homogenous. So I'm going to run through some examples how you would apply different CSP enhancements to build upon what they're doing. Because, you know, when we think of CSP, it's really kind of advanced conservation work. And this, you know, so this landowner has been working in their forest for a number of years. And um, how can we take it to a new level and have them do something a little bit different than they're doing and get some different benefits out of that? Uh, and before I did, I just kind of would build upon what Caitlin was saying with the number of enhancements that are available, um, the way you read these enhancements is the E stands for enhancement and then the practice code. In the forest world, our 666 practice is the most common um, forestry practice. It's our forest stand imp improvement practice. So we have 13 specific enhancements for forestry, but then there's um, many others, wildlife and tree planting and some silvopasture uh, or agroforestry practices that can be used in forest settings. So I don't know in total how many can be used in the forest. I haven't counted that up, but I bet you a hundred of them might be available. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to take three of these forest enhancements and show you how they might be applied in that same model forest. Um, so the first one, is the 666F, which is to reduce forest stand density to create open forest um, stand structure. And I mentioned earlier, if you look at that, the reference picture, this is a relatively intact forest canopy. Um, so the enhancement description, and this is how you'd screen if it's a good um, fit for what your operation and what you're trying to accomplish. Here, we're trying to reduce the forest stand density to create open forest conditions with low basal area, which is, growing stock or the amount of trees and what that does is concentrate the health and vigor of the uh, on the residual trees that are left but at the same time opens the stand structure more than the landowner was doing previously to allow for a diverse understory to develop and this could be used um, for wildlife habitat improvement it might be to to improve the structural composition of the forest and uh, allow for certain regeneration to occur might even be used for wild, uh, wildfire um, fuel reduction in certain circumstances. So there's a variety of reasons in all of these forestry practices how we might get to an end goal. Um, but when we look at the criteria here uh, for what what the landowner would have to do, they would have to develop if they don't already have a forestry plan or update a forestry plan to reflect these, these current uh, objectives. Um, in this case, they'd thin the, the forest stand down to a target basal area that's about half of what is common, uh, commonly found in New Jersey um, in order to kind of uh, facilitate the understory development that I was mentioning. Uh, our criteria specifies 
that you know this can occur in places where thinning has already been done or parts of your forest maybe where you haven't gotten the up the opportunity to do the thinning yet and it just out outlines some other things that you know if if it's possible these can be sold uh the trees that is that are being thinned and uh, um you know and then if they can't be thinned and have to be left on site you know we want to recognize that we have other practices that might help um, kind of deal with that issue. So I'm not going to go over all these uh, things, but just as Caitlin had mentioned, this is how we would, out of those criteria, we have um, outlined what the participant will do. And so in this case, you know, you'll work with your forester to get an updated plan and go through all those, um, the criteria. I'm not going to go through each one of them. And then there's that section in our activity sheets showing what NRCS will do. And in this case, we're going to help you understand the practices, work with your forester to develop that plan and understand how our practices, other practices that are complementary might be used in this same enhancement to um, reach those objectives. So I'm going to, like I said, try and show you this visually after that first example. This is another part of that same forest where the understory was very dense with a homogeneous layer of spice bush. And um, the canopy is pretty intact. So our first step in the process was we were going to mechanically mow this area to reduce that spice bush layer. And um, this picture just kind of shows that in process, how the mowing reduced that understory layer. Then concurrently, we would implement our 666, which is our forest and improvement treatment to reduce the basal area to about half of what was there beforehand. And what you can see that this really opens the forest structure up and allows a lot more sunlight to reach the forest floor. Uh, in this case, the landowner was able to do this partially commercially and also um, some of the material was not commercial. So you can see some trees that were left behind and we use some other practices to consolidate the woody material and make the site accessible. And then this is the result. So um, within one year, you can see that the conditions of this forest look dramatically different than what um, was occurring before. So the enhancement really is kind of doing things a different way than before to diversify this forest and get a different understory composition. So we have now forbs and grasses and herbs and tree regeneration occurring where previously it was just kind of a, a uniform homogenous um, understory of spice bush and you and the open forest um, structure here now provides a different habitat element for biodiversity purposes. So moving on to the second example, um, this one is, we're going to apply in that same forest stand. This one's entitled snags, den trees, and coarse woody debris for wildlife habitat. And I mentioned earlier that when I when I was talking about the stumps here, this landowner was harvesting all this wood uh, that it that he was taking out as cull trees and using it as firewood. And if you look at the photo, there's really a dearth of not only woody deb debris on the forest floor, but there are no standing dead trees, all things that are kind of ha important habitat elements. Um, so with a wildlife emphasis, now that this landowner has worked through and addressed some of his thinning uh, objectives, now the enhancement might look to improve wildlife habitat through the creation of uh, and retention of more snags, den trees, wolf trees and you know put some cover on the forest floor for wildlife so the enhancement is we're doing our this practice a little bit differently to create better wildlife habitat and so what this would look like going through the process during um, our criteria and our documentation is we would you would the landowner would be working with their consultant forester to estimate how many uh, snags which are dead trees or cavity dentries like you see on the right hand side that may have been culled and taken out as firewood before, how many they have per acre now. And we have a minimum object objective of trying to achieve at least two or more in these different size classes that you see. And then um, and then during the imp so the implementation is going to be to create these snags and um, add at least one brush pile per acre. So previously, the landowner would have culled these trees as part of the thinning and taken that wood that you see laying down out. And now we're going to, the landowner is going to instead girdle some of these trees like on the left that you see and kill it and leave it standing for wildlife habitat. And there's logs that will be left on the ground. And in the picture on the right hand side, you could see a tree that was girdled and all the way up at the top. 
I don't know if you can see my cursor. There's now a cavity in that tree for wildlife. And there's a lot of coarse woody debris, these large sections of trees that are laying on the ground, which are important habitat elements for amphibians and small um, forest mammals. You know, and with uh, going back to that idea of like not extracting all the wood, we're going to have them leave some of the tops and start to create brush piles out of them. And in some cases, even leave large pieces of wood just to kind of provide those habitat elements that weren't on the forest floor before. So that is that enhancement used in the same forest just for a different purpose. And now I'm going to do one more really quickly at the risk of boring you with forestry talk. But this one um, is called creating structural diversity with patch openings. And the reason I chose this is it's um, somewhat similar to the first uh, example I showed you. But that first example was kind of tr we treated the, the forest uniformly across the entire stand and in here. What the, what the objective is to create openings of various sizes and various shapes that would pr provide opportunities for different suites of plants and vegetation to regenerate differently and provide different habitat elements. So we have some criteria on the sizes of the patches that we'd want to include and how many patches across the um, stand would be would be made. And Quickly to go through this, this was another part of that same forest uh, that hadn't been thinned before. So we would have the landowner through with their consulting forester mark trees for removal in small patches that are felled to create these small gaps that would facilitate certain uh, trees that have uh, the ability to grow in uh, under certain light regimes to to get started in those gaps. And then parts of the stand, we would make much bigger gaps. As you can see, these contractors were working to fill a big area, and that would and this patch was uh, probably several acres in size. And that's um, not only does it permit different tree species and shrub species to grow under different light conditions, but it really provides a different habitat element. So that's three three examples on the same forest. How depending on what your objectives are, you might be able to take the type of thinning operation you were doing it and take it to a new level to achieve some other goals. And I'll just wrap this up by saying that, you know, I talked a lot about the the FSI enhancements or our, or our 666 enhancements, but on forest land, you, you, we really do have a lot of other opportunities, uh, including prescribed burning. We have a few enhancements for that. There's many tree and shrub planting enhancements. Um, there's some brush management and, and certainly a lot of the pollinator plantings are even applicable on forest land. Um, so that was my last slide. That's um, all I have. So I will turn it back over to Ty. And Thank you, Don. Yep. Um, well, we've heard a lot about our enhancements and what we do. So now I think it's important to talk about what's in it for you money wise. So Fran, I'll turn it over to you. And I can see your screen. You're muted. Oh, yep. Nope. There you um, go. <laughs> oh, here. So now this Thank is my you. favorite part. My favorite part, Ty, right here. But we've had our overview, Ty, and we've had Don and Caitlin talk about some enhancements. And they talked about five enhancements of many, many enhancements that we offer. So that was just like a a little, you know, uh, just a little like we're dipping our toe just a little bit into the water of all the possibilities that there are with taking your conservation to the next level. So, um, Don, I don't know. It was a it's a tie there between the cropland and the pasture land and the forest land um, enhancements. But I did have to pick one to um you know, kind of showcase for uh, for payments here. So, oh, I did use that uh that cover crop enhancement. I'm just a little more familiar with uh, cropland than I am with forest land, and that's you know I'll just leave it at that. So, anyway, so I am going to give just a real quick um, overview of some payment uh, examples for CSP. So you remember that I mentioned earlier 
existing activities do not change from year to year. And to receive a payment for existing activities, you must meet basic eligibility requirements at the time of application and plan an additional activity on each land use that a payment will be received. So also the payments for those existing activities do not change from year to year. For existing activities, there are two types of payments. The first one is comprised of a fixed payment rate for resource concern categories met at the time of application, plus that per acre payment by land use. And that second one is a flat rate for each land use. And both payments are planned for the length of the contract, which is five years. So those existing payments are for those great conservation um, activities that you are already implementing on your ground. So let's not be, no one be scared by this slide right here, by this, this um, report that we generate. So this is just an example of a CSP report that is generated from our system. And for this one in here, for this one in particular, this is for cropland but there can be up to five different reports based on the land uses identified, right? We remember there's the cropland and pasture land, there's forest land, um, and there can be also uh, our associated ag land, and there can also be our farmstead. But because there are, should, on this particular Example, there are two different uh, management uh, systems on this farm. That means we must look at the resource concerns differently for each crop group. You will see at the top of this report that the acreage that is associated with each crop group. So we have 94.2 acres with the residue not harvested and 99.6 acres with the residue harvested. From there, you'll see the resource concerns that are being addressed and that's right at the bottom of, the, of this report at the time of application for each crop group. The number of resource concerns are then applied to a level for payment uh, purposes. So once the level is determined for each land use and crop group within those land uh, uses, this payment chart is used to figure out the rate per acre for each level. And new for this year, there are higher payment rates for those applicants certifying as historically underserved, such as a beginning farmer, socially disadvantaged, or limited resource farmer. And you'll see all the different payment rates for cropland and pasture land. We do not have rangeland in New Jersey and our forest land. And you'll see with our associated ag land, that AAL and the farmstead, there is only level one and two. So our level one is when you're addressing fewer resource concerns at um, time of application, and level two is a few more, and level three is seven plus. Even though we learned in the previous uh, presentation, you could be, we could assess up to 17 resource concerns, but we cap those payments at seven plus. So in this example, I'll be using the traditional payment rate for 193.8 acres of cropland from the report previously shown. There were two different crop groups, the 94.2 acres of residue not harvested. And since there were four resource concerns identified at the time of application, that is a level two with a rate of $7.71 per acre which equals $726.28 per year. And for a five-year contract, that would be $3,631.40. Then there were 99.6 acres of residue removed, and there were three resource concerns identified at the time of application. And that is a level one with a rate of $5.85 per acre, which equals $582.66 per year for a five-year contract and that would be $2,913.30. Together, that equals $6,544.70 for the first 
a year of this contract. The next payment is easy to calculate. For non-historically underserved applicants, a flat rate of $1,800 is received for each land use, receiving a payment, and $3,000 is received for historically underserved applicants. So if you had cropland and pasture land, you would get, and you are non-historically um, underserved, you would get a flat rate of $1,800 per year for each of those um, land uses. So this, show, this slide um, shows the calculations, for example, over five year period, and that would be $9,000. Additional activities are those practices and enhancement or bundles, and at least one activity must be planned on a contract. In this example, I'm going to keep it simple and plan that Maudie species cover crop to improve soil health and increase soil organic matter that Caitlin had um, demonstrated earlier. This enhancement is planned by the acre and does not have to be planned on all acres. And it can be planned for one to five years. Here we see the calculations for the for 99.6 acres of multi-species cover crop that will be planted in October 2024, 25, 26, and 27 at $16.61 per acre resulting in a $1,654.36 payment per year and $6,617.44 for the four years the cover crop is planted. Now you might ask, if this is a five-year contract, why am I only getting paid for planting cover crop for four years? As I explained earlier, payments are made in the following fiscal year. In this example, if awarded a CSP contract, now, this year, you may not have time to plant that cover crop before October 1st, 2024. But no worries, NRCS will go over your planning schedule for any practices and enhancements when establishing your contract. So if you are able to, say, plan a cover crop prior to October 1st, then yes, you may be able to get a payment this year for that cover crop. So let's look at the summary of payments for each year of this five-year contract based on the example. Remember, the EAP-1 and the EAP-2 payments will not change if the acreage remains the same because these are the payments for maintaining those resource concerns already being addressed at the time of application. In 2024, you will receive your first payment for those existing resource concerns being addressed and since you didn't plant the cover crop by October 1st, there will not be a payment for that. In this example, the first year did not reach the minimum payment of $4,000. So the amount paid will be increased to reach that amount. The remaining four years will assume the cover crop is planted. The five-year total payment for this contract will be $23,053.20. So now that you have an obligated contract, it's time to begin implementing your conservation plan. Remember, this includes maintaining those existing activities in addition to any new activities. And we did learn that there are lots and lots of enhancements that um, may be uh, beneficial to your land. So are there any questions about anything, the overview, the enhancements, or um, the payment rates that I just uh, reviewed. And Ty, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, friend. And I just want to say it out loud. We had a question in the chat. Are these payments considered taxable income? Which I did reply. And yes, these payments are considered taxable income. Um, you will receive a form. Uh, I'm not sure of the right number of the form, but I think it might be a 1099. Um, yep. Yes, it is. It's a 1099 and they should be actually you should have gotten them by now um, mm -hmm. for um, 2023. Yep, that's correct. So I'm going to go back and share my screen and um, I will ask Craig to come up. 
Um, he will talk about what's next. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Craig Keene AC. Uh, I've been with the agency now for 22 years as a conservation planner, so I'm familiar with a lot of this stuff. And if a lot of this made you scared and looked confusing, um, as planners, we go through this every year for training. We get really trained up on it. and. Um, it seems overwhelming, but we're really good at it. And uh, any planner that's working with you can walk you through it. And um, if not, they will reach out to me or other folks in the state office to help them out. So we will get you through this. So I'm going to go through the uh, the next steps of this. Um, so what you can expect. And unfortunately, I have a very boring slide for you with no pictures, no dung beetles or cows or trees. Uh, and I'll go pretty quickly through this because we are getting close. Uh, so the call from the field office. So the next step here is, and I think this is the probably most important step, uh, is that it's going to be completed with you. The NRCS planners assigned to you and to your application will contact you to set up an appointment. And some things that planners going to want to discuss, uh, Fran had kind of reviewed, and I'll go over them again. They're going to want to review your producer farm data report, and they're doing that in order to identify tracks that show you as the owner, operator, operator, or other tenant. Uh, they'll also want to discuss that you'll have control of those tracks for the term of the contract, which would be five years. And any land, uh, as you're reviewing, that is not under your control is not eligible to be included with your CSP contract. The planner will also bring along maps, and you'll need to identify the land use. For example, uh, and we discussed this, the cropland, pasture land, farmstead, associated ag land, or forest. And the planner will help you to understand what those land use identifications mean and how they will impact your proposed contract. Uh, the planner will also want to discuss tillage practices, crop rotations, any concerns you have, you know, that you'd identified as you're out there managing the land, uh, such as any persistent erosion, any fields that are too wet, anything that's too dry, et cetera. Uh, following that step, there will be the assessments that we'll do to complete uh, the, I'm sorry, to establish a threshold eligibility. And once that threshold eligibility is determined, the field office will reach out to you to go over any practices or enhancements that you'll need to decide that you want to add to your contract. And depending on the type of operation, the planner will assess, you know, any conservation practices installed and any resource concerns identified. And that'll help us to determine that whether you're meeting or exceeding, which we had just looked at on that report, you have any of those specific thresholds. And based on meeting or exceeding those thresholds, the planner is going to again reach out and discuss any additional conservation practices or enhancements, which can improve your stewardship threshold score. And the uh, conservation planner will also reach out to discuss the, pros pro the proposed project and they'll really want to kind of finalize uh, timelines for the practice implementation with you. The uh, application ranking and the cost estimate as the next step, and that planner will reach out to you to review that cost estimate. And, and there's a time after this step if you determine the feasibility be based on that estimate and confirm with your planner that you're sure you would like to move forward uh, with that contract. And at that time, we usually encourage you to contact potential contractors to understand the actual project cost related to any work that you will be hiring out to be completed. Following that, uh, you'll be contacted if you're selected for funding uh, to complete contract documents. And this is that last step. If you've worked with us before um, at, through our EQIP program or AMA programs, that's when the, we'll reach out to you, uh, want to meet with you to go over the proposed contract, review all of the documentation, and then go through and sign all those documents, turning it into an actual contract. So those are the next steps. If anybody has any questions, uh, we can again ask now or post it in the chat. Greg, we do have a question in the chat. Um, is there a tool that we can use to calculate the EAP one for various activities? Uh, I, can I would. Oh, I'm sorry, Craig, but there no, is ahead, not. <laughs> there, no. no, there is not a tool. And the reason why there is not a tool is because we have to look when, as Craig just said, when the NRCS planner, um, you know, comes out and does that assessment, you know, it, it's all depending on how many resource concerns that EAP1 is based on how many resource concerns um, 
that you're addressing at time of application. So that's why there is not a tool. It's just that um, we have that CSP report that then we'll use to and take that information to calculate the EAP1. So unfortunately, there isn't a tool because there isn't a simple uh, answer to plug in numbers to a tool to give you that dollar amount. Yeah, but the, the planner can go over that report with you and, and that's Correct. what they will do. Once once we run through that threshold, they'll want to meet with you and yep. go over that and see how we can address it. So you will, you will have access to what we're us, utilizing to come up with that score. Absolutely. So you'll see how many resource concerns you are addressing at time of application and then you'll know what level you're in and then, you know, that will uh, dictate how much uh, per acre you will earn based on that level. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, Fran. Um, now uh, it's time for some stories, you know, let some of our producers uh, to tell their stories. So first we have uh, Mike Welk from Welk Farm. Uh, Welk Farm is located in the Pine Barrens regions and is among the largest producer of pasture-raised sheep in the state. Welk Farm has been in operation since 2001 and it has he has been working with us um in csp since 2022 so mike i turn it over to you let me uh oh. mike i think you can uh mute unmute yourself now <laughs> Sorry, guys, looks like. Mike, are you there? You might have to promote him to be a presenter. Uh, make a presenter. There's so many options here. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not really sure what's going on. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. So please share your experience. Feel free to share as much or as little as you want, uh, but we just want to hear your experience working with the field office uh, and your experience with CSP. Yeah, it's a great program. I, I can't go into all the details like you did on all the practices that I'm uh, using, other than I would tell you this, the one practice I am, uh, I did implement on my uh, sheep farm. And, you know, for many years, I, I started rotational grazing many years ago when I first got into uh, raising livestock, started with cattle and then uh, went over to sheep. And I did do rotational grazing. So I had some, you know, quite a bit of experience with it. But then, like everything, life gets busy. Uh, it's time consuming. And you you do other things, and I I reverted to what's not the right practice, which is continual grazing, which is probably like 85, from my understanding, about 85 percent of livestock producers do that, and that is not good. And there's all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't do it. But when I heard about the uh, CSP program through uh, my NS NRCS representative Nicole uh, Siglione, who's great, she uh, helped me all through this whole program i didn't know exactly what practices as you can see from the presentation uh here that there there's a lot of codes and there's a lot of government language you have to go through and it's quite complicated and she just helped me through it and, and bottom line was i implemented rotational grazing again and uh i don't think i would have done it without the csp and it was it's great i'm kind of reinvigorated in my uh, sheep operation again doing rotational grazing i i would send photographs of my of each pasture that i uh put my animals on and you know any of though any anybody who does rotational grazing you know it's more kind of a science than an art but you, you kind of have to watch the grass you got to watch how much grass is being consumed and then 
So I would take photographs. I would uh, go on my uh, photograph app and be able, and I would put in the actual pasture I was using with a number. Uh, I would show that pasture. I would always show the animals in reference to something in that pasture. So I could even use those records to go back and look at later on and say, hey, this is where I was. And I would put the date there. And I would send four of these photographs to Nicole uh, after I was done with four rotations, because I, I think more than fo four photographs was just too much for the email. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it worked out great. I was, um, you know, when rot rotational grazing, you sometimes change the size of your paddock. So, uh, you know, we all have a grazing plan, those of us in rotational grazing. And you do have to adjust that sometimes based on the the how the grass is growing, you know, and that's all dependent on the moisture you're getting, how the animals are consuming it, and certainly your uh, the quality of your forage. So it's, uh, but I would tell you this, CSP, great program, sign up, you'll love it. That's all I have to say, unless you have any other questions. Thank you, Mike, for sharing a little bit of what you've done with us. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question. Feel free to share or not. But like, how do you feel about the payments you have received through the enhancements and the, you know, the research concerns that you've done? Um, how do you feel about taking, you know, conservation to another level, which is what we like to say? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the payments are certainly were, were very, uh, you know, very good for what I what I was doing. Uh, I tell you, go into rotational grazing. I did kind of rediscover I have to cut back on my flock. But, you know, uh, because you just can't, you know, when you're rotationally grazing, your your pastures can only support so many animals. And I think I was overstocked for a long time. And so I reduced my my animal uh, levels. And uh, and I guess if you could look at it, you know, by going into the CSP, uh, that those payments are making up for the reduced animals that I have uh, been selling at the auction. So, uh, yeah, I think it's very fair. It's a great program and can't say enough about it. And like I said, it's kind of re it's allowed me to implement a practice I probably would not have done without the CSP payments encouraging me to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, CSP pays you pretty much for taking that conservation to the next level. So I am glad that you are very happy about that. Um, thank you so much for sharing. So now um, we have another producer. Uh, we have Ray Lubick on the line uh, from Lubick Farms. Mr. Lubick has been farming together with family for many years. They have a farm stand located in Chesterfield. They grow vegetables, fruits, uh, row crop, beef livestock, and more. He has been doing CSP with us um, since 2020. Um, Ray, I will turn it over to you to share your experience with CSP. Okay, I, I, I assume you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. So. Uh, a couple of the practices that we we worked with, um, we we uh, replanted the uh, pastures that we had with multi-species uh, crops, and then um, of course we had the the ongoing uh, practices that we have, and then the second thing that we did was the multi-species cover crop, and we're I think in the fourth or fifth year of that fourth year of that I think right now, and I mean my my I would have to say that the 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 program has been very easy to work with. I think the payments have been, you know, quite fair as far as encouraging people to, you know, become part of the program. And I have to say that I think that you know the the, the program has been very good as far as encouraging me to, you know, go with some some different practices. And I you know I can't say you know enough about the program as far as it being, um, you know, it the the CSP program itself being good. I mean, I've worked with NRCS for quite a few years, and I have to say that I think all of the programs that we've that I've worked with them on uh, over the years have have turned out well for me. I'm, I'm very appreciative of the services that they do for us. Awesome, Ray. Thank you very much. I love to hear that. Um, is there anything else you would like to share about working with the NRCS office? Well. Uh, I say over the years, I, I, you know, I, I've worked with the NRCS office probably for over 20 years, maybe even longer than that. Um, 
um, we, we, we started, you know, with drain tiling and, and trying to, you know, um, take care of some erosion problems on the farm. And then we, uh, we, we put up a, a, a site for the chemical storage. Uh, and we also did, a, a, a worked with them with the uh, plan for the, the manure management uh, for the animals that we have. And uh, like I say, over the years, um, all of the programs have been very beneficial to us. Um, the payments that they've come with, um, they've come out with, uh, have, have been very fair. Uh, I, I can't say enough about, um, you know, the, the, the uh, they're very, I can't say that they, they've ever been a problem to work with. You know, if there was ever a problem, we were able to work through it fairly easily. So, um, you know, uh, we, we also did a, a, another project where, I had some erosion problems with with a stream that's running through our farm, and the cattle eroding part of the bank, and you know worked through all that. So um, over the years, I mean, I've used a lot of different services that they've that they've had available, and I have to say that uh, you know I'm I'm very uh, appreciative of everything they've done for us, and I think the program you know is very good as far as helping the farmers out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ray. We do love working with you. Um, so I'm glad that you're kind of satisfied, you know, with the service we provided. And, you know, not everything is perfect. Sometimes there are hiccups. So I think communication is a big part of, you know, making things work. So I appreciate you. Um, and 